It's officially a pandemic. The World Health Organization says the coronavirus can still be contained. But with thousands dead and infection rates on the rise, are more drastic measures necessary? And Imran Garda in today's Newsmaker is the global response to the coronavirus pandemic. What began as an outbreak in China's Hebei province in December has gone on to infect and kill people in every continent on Earth except Antarctica. On the news, alarming predictions of dystopian scenarios, while online coronavirus trackers feel like doomsday clocks. Mecca, the Vatican and Venice are deserted. Classrooms in Poland are empty. Cricket games in India are being played in empty stadiums. And the Mona Lisa is off limits. The busiest spaces now are on social media, which is rife with fake cures and viral videos of empty supermarket shelves and people fighting over toilet paper. All of this as more borders are closed, more planes are grounded, and economists are telling us to get ready for a global recession. So is it as bad as we think or worse? We'll ask the experts. But first, Haider Abbasi has the latest. Some of the most popular places in the world are abandoned. Entire cities are under lockdown. Sports stadiums are empty. This is life under coronavirus. After first emerging in the Chinese city of Wuhan, the outbreak has spread across the world in just a few months. And it doesn't discriminate. From government ministers to celebrities, no one is safe. The virus causes the disease known as COVID-19 it's killed more than 4,600 people so far. The World Health Organization says there are more than 126,000 confirmed cases in more than 110 countries. And it seems it's only going to get worse before it gets better. In the days and weeks ahead, we expect to see the number of cases, the number of deaths, and the number of affected countries climb even higher. WHO has been assessing this outbreak around the clock and we're deeply concerned both by the alarming levels of spread and severity and by the alarming levels of inaction. We have therefore made the assessment that COVID-19 can be characterized as a pandemic. The worst affected countries outside China are Italy, Iran and South Korea. Although China's health commission says it passed the peak of the epidemic. The number of new cases there has fallen to its lowest since January. Although a vaccine is in the process of being developed, there's no known cure. Governments are trying their best to stop it spreading. After consulting with our top government health professionals, I have decided to take several strong but necessary actions to protect the health and well-being of all Americans. To keep new cases from entering our shores, we will be suspending all travel from Europe to the United States for the next 30 days. But many countries, especially in Europe, have been criticized for being slow to react. And then there's the economic cost. This week, stock markets plunged to their lowest since the 2008 financial crisis. One and a half trillion dollars was wiped off global shares. And the president of the European Central Bank, Christine Lagarde, has warned of a recession unless governments take urgent action. So what should countries be doing to control the spread of coronavirus? And will the world be able to contain it? Ada Abbasi, The Newsmakers. Well, I'm joined now from Geneva by World Health Organization spokesman Tarek Yasharovich. Tarek, good to have you back on the Newsmakers. A big word, pandemic. Words are important, semantics are important. What changes now that you've labeled it a pandemic? 
Well, the word uh, has been uh, sort of uh, used and misused. Uh, nothing really changes in the terms of what WHO is advising countries to do. Uh, nothing is changing in, uh, in the terms of what WHO is doing and uh, has not been doing before, for example. Uh, we have declared global health emergency on January 30th uh, this year over this outbreak, and this is really the highest level of alarm we have. It, simply, Director General yesterday said that having more more countries reporting cases of COVID-19, more people around the world being exposed to the virus. This can be now considered uh, as, as pandemic. And for that reason, it's even more pressing that countries put in place uh, measures that we have been recommending for weeks now. And it is basically contain the spread, detect, uh, treat and protect population and make sure that all resources are being pulled out uh, by all parts of the society. Uh, so, so, so everyone can uh, uh, can a role uh, uh, to fulfill can play the role uh, uh, to 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 try to reduce the uh, 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 the risk of, of further spread. Tarek, WHO was criticised for prematurely using the word pandemic in 2009 with H1N1. Does that mean that there was more deliberation this time around, and there was more caution when it came to finally deciding that it's reached that level now? Well, we have been uh, monitoring this outbreak really round the clock, as Director General has said. And really, as you have said, it, this, is, this is really about semantics. Uh, what does not change is really that this is a global health emergency and countries have to step up uh, their preparedness. Uh, this affects now all of the society. We, this cannot be let only to ministries of health and health workers uh, any longer. We see around the world uh, uh, that, uh, that uh, this situation is affecting economy, is affecting uh, societies. Uh, uh, is affecting a uh, way of life uh, for many people. Uh, and this is why it is important that governments organize they, uh, the, their, uh, uh, their machinery and the society as a whole to try to bring the response. And the response has to be a mix of measures. Uh, first, uh, countries who have fewer cases, they should definitely try to go after the virus, try to identify people who are sick, uh, try to identify those who may have been exposed, try already at the early stage to uh, uh, to isolate uh, the, 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 the transmission chains and in that way try to disrupt it. And in some other uh, uh, stage, uh, basically, to try with the containment measures that have uh, been proven effective in China, uh, South Korea and Singapore, where we see uh, that, uh, that the number of cases is dropping. OK, so, yeah, they, the Chinese have said they've passed the peak of it. How do they know and what exactly does that mean? Does it mean it's going to slowly go away or that it might actually come back and we might see the numbers jump again. Well, from our side, the WHO, uh, we really prefer not to do any predictions because uh, things uh, can go uh, one way uh, or another. We should really focus on finding solutions. Solutions are threefold. One is basically working on research and development for vaccines and, and new treatments. Secondly, strengthening health systems. Make sure that every health system uh, in the world is ready to respond to this, that every country has a plan what to do if they receive 100 patients patients who need to be treated, how they will go about uh, uh, identifying uh, close contacts, how they will go about uh, treating those who are sick and protecting uh, uh, others. Uh, and at the same time, population has its own very important role to play to adopt behavior that will reduce the risk of, uh, uh, of further transmission and to make sure that they follow the advice provided by health authorities. Tariq Yasharafic, good to have you back on the program. Unfortunately, I think we're going to have to speak to you again sometime soon. Um, I look forward to talking to you, but I don't look forward to talking to you about this. Wish you all the best. Speak to you soon. Let's broaden out the discussion now by going to Dr. ben Hur Lee in New York. He's a professor of microbiology at the Ekan School of Medicine at Mount Sinai. Salvatore Babonis is an associate professor at Sydney University and an author specializing in the political economy of China. And under lockdown in Rome is Valerio Bordonaro, an advisor to former Prime Minister Enrico Letta. And you would note that we have one guest in a studio in New York and the two on Skype are at home in two countries where there are major worries about corona. Let's go to the one where there's the biggest worry on this panel in Italy. Valerio, how are you feeling? What is it like under lockdown, first of all? Uh, well, it's weird. It's the first time in 
everyone's life, I guess, here in, in Italy. Um, this is the fifth day I'm not going out from my place. I was having a cold, so I was recommended not to move um, from my domicile, um, even if I'm uh, COVID negative, so no worries about that. But in order not to uh, make any confusion outside and not to um, overcharge the sanitary system, we are asked, asked to stay home. Right. Valeria, a lot of people have died. A lot of people are sick. I wonder, you have to take, when you're quarantining and, and practicing social distancing, it's, it's quite authoritarian. You have to force people to, you know, to stay home and to stay away from shops and so on. By and large, have people bought into it? Have they bought into the, the fact that they can't go and watch football games and so on? Um, as you can see now, uh, it took a while. Uh, we had to take um, some measure to prepare the um, citizenship. But now I see almost everyone on board on this uh, mission. This is a national mission to uh, stay together while being uh, far away from each other. But the mission is to uh, avoid the spreading of the virus. So I see everyone on board. Doctor, okay, Dr. Ben Hurley, should we be as worried as we are? Yes. Should we be less worried? Should we be more worried? Where are we right now? Are we, are we overreacting? We should... Um, no, we should have been worried two weeks ago. Hmm. Um, this is not news. Um, you know, um, when people say things early, they're afraid of fear-mongering, and there's definitely some of those going around. But um, being proactive in trying to enact prevention and control measures like Singapore has done, it's extremely important. If you do it in the midst of a panic, people tend to trust you less. And so um, I've said this um, a lot of times in my public social media that uh, truth is really the currency of trust in public health. If you take Singapore as an example, um, why do people listen implicitly? It's because I was in Singapore when the first case was announced. And the government, because of its experience in 2003, immediately had plans on the books to put it into action. And everyone knew what they do. They had a website out on a daily basis. They sent SMS messages out, even just one case. And every cluster that comes on, they tell you how many people have been quarantined. They proactively clear a thousand rooms, you know. And that's how you contain an epidemic. And even with the entire nation's resources, mm. to be fair, Singapore is an extremely efficiently run government. Right. I don't think anyone here will disagree. Right. Um, it has, and so, to be fair, it's easier to manage six million people right. than it is to yeah, manage uh, uh, people with more porous borders. Yeah, and I wonder... But so, uh, you right. have to be right. proactive. Right. Right, and I, and I wonder, to, to that point, right, it's a smaller country yes, and people are more akin to following rules, unlike, for example, the French, for whom protesting is seen as a sort of national sport, right? So Paris Saint-Germain versus Borussia Dortmund played behind closed doors. No fans allowed in the stadium. What did the fans do, Dr. Lee? They just hung out outside. I don't know how many thousands of people were outside, but they all clumped together outside to support their team. So... It doesn't work. What do you do about that? That's what I said, you know, when you're when you the government has to earn the trust of the people, right? I mean, in you know, you don't react. The whole point about public health is you have to prepare for something that will eventually come. And most governments, they don't put See, when public health works, and there are people in this panel that know this much better than I do, if it works, nothing happens, right? So you don't right. see the results. Right. But that's because measures are working. It's only when it fails, then you blame the public health authorities. That's kind of unfair because when public health authorities are doing their work, you don't see it. And then people think, you know, that they're, they're not doing stuff. So they are in a, I don't want to criticize them because they, they are very good people all over the world that they're doing their best. Uh, that are under incredible pressures, in, you know, and I'm not even one of the public health authorities. Right. And, you know, I go, it's, anyway, there are people are under a lot of stress right now, but the important point is it doesn't matter if this, it's 
uncontainable or is called a pandemic because if that work shocks people into adopting prevention and control measures, this is not just a government responsibility right now. It's everyone's responsibility. Right. You know, yeah. they should protect. They should practice social distancing and hand hygiene. Right. It has spread to 114 countries. Salvatore yes. Babonis, we're seeing this ripple uh, in terms of economic stress. We're seeing uh, right. social problems. The longer that this endures, how much damage is it going to cause to our world on multiple levels? Well, actually, I think some of the economic impacts have been overstated, and that's because there's been such a dramatic drop in stock markets. But if you start unpicking that and looking at details, you see that internet companies have dropped by the same amount as other companies. Well, internet companies are very unlikely to be directly affected by the coronavirus epidemic. And what we're seeing here really is you know, an overvalued stock market that this has been the prompt, this has been the, the pin that pricked the bubble, uh, but it was an overvalued stock market to begin with. And I think we should all keep that in mind. I think the economic impacts are likely to be very targeted. If you think of an economy even like Greece, Greece is the most tourist-dependent economy in the world outside of a few small Caribbean islands. And even in Greece, tourism is only about 9% of GDP. Now, the tourism sector is going to be heavily affected for three to six months in Greece, and Greece will go into recession as a result of the coronavirus, no doubt about this. But other countries that have had production shut down for one or two months, for instance, China, which has had factories shut down for a couple months, they may go into a mild recession for the first two quarters of the year, but this is not going to be the kind of economic bloodbath that the markets seem to be pricing in. Yeah, I'm gonna go back to Valerio here because I want to ask what it's like within a country that is experiencing it at a very high level. And you know, this goes for the, the Chinese, the Iranians, the Italians. And as an Italian, again, I wonder about that sense of the, the collective solidarity and the collective vision about what's going on right now. Is there a feeling that we're gonna have to take a lot of pain initially, financially, maybe some of the nice things that we like, we, we can't have in order to ride this out and ensure that as, as few of us as, as possible end up dying. Yes, definitely. This is what we are understanding day by day. We have to suffer at least, at least for 14 days to start seeing results. But if we don't do this seriously, as Dr. Lee was saying, uh, the COVID or coronavirus crisis would last more. And if it lasts more, the economic effect effects would be uh, more affecting our real life. So we need to suffer at this moment. We need to, uh, in a certain, for a certain extent, to change our habits, mm -hmm. but for a small period of time, do it in, doing it seriously, this will end up the spreading of the virus. Right. So what I can say, I'm seeing on, on social medias and on traditional medias, that all the population is really trying to uh, motivate each other to stay home, uh, to adopt all the measures that are um, suggested by the government. Of course, we were not ready. Um, the last possible case that we can uh, try to uh, put next to the COVID is the Spanish flu of 1918, because it was also uh, in Europe, differently from, from the SARS uh, mm -hmm. Chinese of 2003. Uh, but still, it's too far in time, and this is the first uh, epidemic or pandemic happening with globalization. Uh, so it's it's a bit it's a little bit unpredictable, right. or I would say it's totally unpredictable. Uh, but the unity of the country and solidarity among people and being strict to the rules uh, is the main thing to to stop right. the spreading. Do Dr. Lee, are the Italians doing it right at the moment? Um, at the moment, I say that anything is better than nothing, you know, and um, to be this aggressive, I really do applaud them. Um, so, you know, you know, just like how when people were criticizing China, criticize all you want, I cannot get, you know, people don't believe the numbers and stuff like that. But uh, 
uh, it's irrefutable that the numbers are plateauing. Now, mm. will it go up again when the company opens? Who knows? Mm. But if China hadn't bought the world, you know, a couple of weeks of time, um, it would have been much worse by now if only the world had listened. Um, you know, you don't wait until you have clusters of uh, cases. And that's happening not just, you know, in um, uh, Italy or Germany. It's happening in the USA. It's, um, you know, I don't, it's, um, but, you know, if you're proactive, like a, look at Hong Kong, the high, one of the highest density of people in the world, and look at their cases, how well they can be able to maintain it because the entire population has been trained over the years to buy into these public health measures. They don't need to right. be told to wear masks and, you know, not shake hands and stuff like that. And so every day you delay what we call the curve of the epidemic. Right. Um, that saves lives. These young people who think that they are going out and why do I care is mal. It is absolutely true that 80% of the cases are asymptomatic amount. That doesn't mean that you can't spread it to your elderly uncle, your grandmother, your mother, your father. We all have relatives who are in susceptible groups, right? And so every day you stop the spread uh, um, through yourselves, it lengthens the curve of the epidemic. It doesn't grow right. as steep. So any healthcare system has a finite capacity to deal with a surge in cases. And therefore, if you oversee the capacity, then the case mortality rate goes up. But if you expand the epidemic curve, then the health capacity is able to slowly gain up to speed. That saves actual lives. So don't think that you know, these measures that you're taking right. don't contribute. Every little thing helps. Do Dr. Lee, I'm curious to know what you think about what Michael Osterholm has said. He was recently on the Joe Rogan podcast and elsewhere. He and the American Hospital Association believe conservatively that, and this is, you know, a, a, a very high-ranking expert in the industry, he believes that a conservative estimate says 480,000 people could end up dying from this. When you hear that number, does that sound about right? Uh, it, it depends. There are very... People always try to pin scientists down to give binary answers. Hmm. So when you make that statement, I have to ask you, what is the context when all is said and done? When, you know, if the control measures take into place, you know, do people listen? So this, these are uh, numbers. Um, I can't keep up with the flood of information these days. But depending on when it was predicted and what models is used, if this is modeled based on the fact that preventive and control measures are not taken into consideration, then that's not unreasonable. But if you have prevent and control measures like I just did, if you spread out the epidemic curve so that each state, so the U, are you talking about the US, right? Uh, he oh, was yeah. talking about worldwide. Yeah, talking he was talking about, about worldwide, yeah. Were you talking? Oh, he, yeah. oh, he was talking about worldwide. Yeah. Uh, 480,000 cases. Oh, 480,000 uh, deaths, uh, well, possibly. Yeah. I mean, if yeah. you, yes, I mean, yeah, because you, you know, you, you, I mean, look at what has something in Italy, right? So uh, right. if you don't test, you don't know. Right. So um, nothing against other right. countries, but the world exists as the world is. Different countries have different infrastructure. You think India is any different from China? Um, right. when, the, when, the, when it starts exploding, right. um, you know, and Africa, we're beginning to see the tip of the iceberg. South America is Yeah, and we hope it doesn't. Yeah. So it, public health authorities right. have to, yeah. Right, okay, Salvatore, yeah. and I want to well, ask you because we can look at, a... right, Salvatore, we can look at numbers and we can choose which numbers to focus on. So we have predictions that are almost cataclysmic in terms of the numbers of people who will die, or we could look at it right now and say that, hey, 70,000 people have recovered. Maybe that means something really important to us right now. What do we do in terms of confidence and how much does that affect the way we live, not just individually, but globally? Look, I'm very skeptical of epidemiologist numbers when they start talking about half million or millions of deaths. And, you know, we don't know, but uh, this has never happened before, at least not in the last hundred years. And I don't think it's going to happen this time. But that said, I'm not an epidemiologist. I'm only a sociologist and I do study the global economy, not global health. When we talk about the economy, we're really talking about narrow sectors being affected by the virus. So the tourism sector being killed, you know, air, air travel being knocked down. But, you know, the response that people have had, the fear that people have had, the toilet paper panic buying mm, yeah. is really way out of uh, proportion. I, I mean, we could have, even if we had the sort of deaths that people are warning about, and it, 
I don't believe for a second we're going to have that scale of deaths. We would still have plenty of toilet paper in the world. It's just not an issue. Uh, global production networks can stand up to these kinds of disruptions with really only minimal delays and only minimal inconvenience to people. So I think we really need to stop worrying so much about the economy and stay home. I mean, I have at my own university here in Australia, I've been having difficulty getting my dean to cancel a welcome reception for right. international students that's scheduled for Monday. Now, right. why are we holding a welcome reception for international well, students? Well, if the dean is the listening, hopefully, hopefully the dean will cancel if the dean's listening. I, I, I hope she will. <laughs> we have the Melbourne, we have the Australian right. Grand Prix going forward right. on Sunday, despite the fact that the leading driver in the world himself right. is flabbergasted by that fact. And I think we just need to take the health a little more seriously right. and the economy will take care of itself. Okay, gentlemen, I've got a wrap. It's been wonderful talking to all of you. Dr. Ben Hurley, Salvatore Babonis, and Valerio Bordenaro. Pleasure having you all on the Newsmakers. I'm not an expert. All I can say, I guess, is wash your hands, don't be racist, be kind, and listen to the experts. Thank you for watching the Newsmakers. We will see you next time. Bye-bye.